I have spoken around the world quite a bit, and I frequently get asked in the Q&A part of that, people will say, well, you've dealt with presidents and prime ministers and kings and so on over a long period of time, and who has made the greatest difference? And so I ruminate about Gorbachev and one person or another, and of course, in the end, come around to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and I get through talking about them, and I said, well, all things considered, I have to say, Milton Friedman. In December 1976, Milton Friedman won the Nobel Memorial Prize for Economic Science, primarily for his theory of the consumption function, and three volumes on monetary history with Anna Schwartz. That same year, he retired from the University of Chicago and in 1977 began work on a PBS television series, Free to Choose, which was telecast in 1980. An earlier work, Capitalism and Freedom, was the beginning of his lifelong effort to help the general public understand the workings and benefits of free markets. One of the most insightful analyses of Milton Friedman the person was a short fictionalized essay by Leo Rostin titled, An Infuriating Man. Rostin finds Friedman in the guise of one Fenwick, adorable, yet calls him the most unpopular man on our block. And the reason for this contradictory assessment, Fenwick, Friedman, is a man who goes around being logical. He even uses reason at cocktail parties. In 2002, the University of Chicago held a colloquium honoring Milton Friedman's 90th birthday. Professor of English Richard Stern, after observing the event, suggests that Friedman's logic and intellect has been more than matched by his humanity. My respect for him has grown and grown to this very hour when to hear his responses to the discussions at this celebration. They're so clear, they're so alert, they're so humane that I, I think of him as a kind of human dessert, which doesn't mean that he isn't an hors d'oeuvre and an entree as well. But there are very few people whose humanity, whose individuality has been so developed over 90 years that you can say, this is someone very special. This is a man who has been a great teacher in every way. On November 7th and 9th, 2002, Gary Becker, student of Friedman and recipient of the 1992 Nobel Prize in Economics, discussed a life of scholarship with his mentor and friend. Liberty Fund welcomes you to a conversation with Professor Milton Friedman. It's a very nice, really, to have you back at the University of Chicago and here in Hyde Park. You spent over 30 years here, uh, and I was one of your students, one of your earliest students. Now, what I most impressed me when I came in, and I want to get your, your side of it, I saw it as a student, I was, and I remember the first day I attended your class, and I had taken a lot of courses in economics at Princeton, was uh, fairly confident I knew some economics, and after about 10 minutes, you asked a question, and I gave an answer, and you said, that's just restating the question in other words. And I sat down, and I, I thought about it. I said, well, he's absolutely right, and I have a lot of economics to learn. And what I felt I learned from you were, was a lot of different things. One, that you use economic theory to understand the real world, and that this can also help you in public policy decisions. Now, that was, I, I think, what Chicago stood for under you. Now, how did you come to, to the emphasis on this? I think things? that was what Chicago stood for before me. I think that was a key feature of, our, of Jacob Viner's course in economics, that he taught theory as something to be used as a, uh, as a m machine for examining things, in the words which Marshall used, <coughs> an engine, no, <coughs> Marshall's words for it, was an engine of analysis, mm -hmm. and not, uh, as it's sometimes viewed, as a magnificent mathematical structure 
which is to be admired, but not to be used. So I think that's, that's a tradition in Chicago that goes way back. Uh, I'm sure Viner was not the first. In mm -hmm. But he, from my point of view, that's certainly where I got it. But isn't that what helped distinguish Chicago from, well, so I can <coughs> it, so to speak? Uh, very much so. I used to say that there was a distinction between the Valrasian and the Marshallian. Uh, Leon Valras was a great economist, but his contribution was to show how you could think of the economy as a set of simultaneous mm -hmm. equations, as a large interrelated structure mm -hmm. in which everything depended on everything else, all happening simultaneously. And Marshall, on the other, Alfred Marshall, on the other hand, said, well, let's not, that's true, that's in the background, but let's look at the partial equilibrium. Let's not try to get the whole mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. And let's take the steel industry and look at the steel industry. Let's take automobiles and look at automobiles. I guess Marshall was before the days of automobiles. <laughs> he would not have used that <laughs> right. example. But the carriages, uh, maybe he would carriages have Carriages, maybe. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. well, that was an important difference. Now, the students absorbed that. The students at Chicago, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, felt we were learning something, at, as you indicated, very different from what was going on in the rest of the profession that we were Chicagoans and we were sort of in a war with, with the rest of the profession, and that this was a, a, a war that meant you had to try to argue and you had to carry an argument to its conclusions and you often had to take a lot of heat. And in your career, you've certainly, uh, in your teachings and so on, you've taken a lot of unpopular positions, and I'm sure it's gratifying to see many of them <laughs> have been adopted, but, uh, how did you feel? I mean, we, we, as a student, I couldn't tell. You, 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 I heard you give, for example, uh, you, uh, you talk on vouchers, school vouchers, when I was a graduate student. I heard you give many other parts of capitalism and freedom. These were totally new from the point of view of the students. How did you feel taking these unpopular stands? <clears throat> well, it's, it's not easy to answer that question, but you're certainly describing the atmosphere correctly. I recall very well a student coming to see me to see me who was a student at Harvard and he said he had come out west to see that black not devil black something or other <laughs> he heard of a black magician <laughs> a black magician he had been told about. Uh, but you know you're most affected by the immediate area you're with mm -hmm. and the beauty of Chicago was that I wasn't alone that I was one of a very broad group this was the this was the approach, as I say, of Viner as my teacher. Right. But uh, when I was there, my fe the fellows around there, uh, it was really the approach of most, well, George Tigler was there later. Came a little later. Later. Mm -hmm. But uh, Alan Wallace, right. who was in School of Business, uh, Aaron Director, who was right. course, law yeah. school, uh, Gail Johnson, uh, Ted Schultz, it was, a, it was a collegial environment in which there were half a dozen. I think it is almost impossible for one person, isolated, to maintain a, uh, a non-acceptable, uh, a non-position that is not accepted by the other people. Uh, you don't have to have the other... We had plenty of people who were on the other side right. as well. You want an environment in which there are people on both sides, but on which there are enough people of your view so as to give mutual reassurance. Now one of the big innovations that I attribute to you was the workshop system at Chicago and I, I was a student I, I, I participated in and then when I was a young faculty member we went down and bought some used Marchands. I don't know if you remember. No, I remember them. We paid three hundred dollars a piece <laughs> for right, them. Something like that. Now how did you come to start? I mean that was a, a tremendous I think, revolution in how to teach uh, well, people I'm to not, do research. I'm not sure I was entirely the originator. Uh, quite the opposite. I think Ted Schultz, really, uh, he started a kind of an agricultural workshop. Mm -hmm. But I guess where I did innovate was not in having a workshop, but in the way I ran it. Because most of the workshops were kind of like, just like seminars. Mm -hmm. People would come and give papers and there would be discussions. Mm -hmm. And I, as you remember, established uh, a couple of rules. So to attend the workshop, you had to be willing to produce a paper during the course of the year. And second, the paper had to be written and distributed before the meeting. Absolutely. And crucial. the meeting would be devoted entirely mm -hmm. to discussion of the paper. Mm -hmm. And I think those rules were very productive because they, with, with a series of seminars in which people could, 
come in, there's, there's very little carryover because uh, it's, if it's the first time you hear a talk, your response is not going to be very profound. Mm -hmm. You'll find trivial things in the main. Right. There are, must be, there are exceptions, of course, but in the main. And this was especially very good for the youngsters who were writing their dissertation. So it was pretty successful, I think, of turning out quite a number of significant dis dissertations. I know, I, but I, I worked a lot in, the, in that workshop with you. And, and I, think, I think the difference between having a paper distributed ahead of time and not is it's easier for the speaker, but it's less productive for both the speaker and the audience if, when, uh, when it's not distributed ahead of time. So the speaker doesn't, since people can't make good comments, it's an easier talk to give because you're not sure. going to be criticized very much. And you come away maybe feeling a little better about yourself. My feeling is often giving workshops, you learn a lot. You don't come along feeling you, you did that well, but when you think about it, you got a lot out of it. Anyway, certainly the workshop, having it ahead of time, you get much, much better uh, quality discussions. Okay. Now, you, you, you did a lot of your writing while you were at Chicago. I mean, the oh, most consumption things. function book, monetary right. history, um, capitalism and freedom, uh, your presidential address to the American Economic Association on unemployment and inflation yeah. and why the Phillips curve was all wrong. Um, your uh, flexible exchange rates. I mean, I can go on and on with, sure. with these are all uh, periods that came uh, over that uh, period of time. So I wanted to ask you, among your writings, this is the 40th anniversary, I think, of Capitalism and Freedom, uh, which was a very influential book. Uh, not any, uh, I don't think there's any graphs or mathematics in the book, not but it's all. closely reasoned. It's a closely reasoned, a lot of economic analysis in the book that had an enormous influence on public policy and thinking about public policy. Now, as you look back on, uh, on that book, to take just one of a number of examples, uh, what do you consider, you know, if you had to mention a few of, of the most important uh, uh, contributions that you made in that book on, the, in, on different subjects? I think of a few, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear how, how you look at it. Well, I should say, I think one reason for the why the uh, the book had as much has had as much circulation as it has is really the fact that first of all it was based on lectures on, on written and uh, sp spoken English is different from written English and then those lectures were transcribed into the book by really by Rose oh okay. and she took the transcripts and converted them into the text of the book and so. I think a lot of the, it is because uh, if I had started from scratch to write it, it would be much more technically oriented. It would be less readable, I believe, than going from a... And this were lectures giving to a general audience, these, not a no, group? No, oh, no, n not no. a general audience. Uh, these, uh, one of the foundations, Volcker Foundation, brought together in the summer for a summer group of audiences, uh, academics from economics, from political science, from okay. history. But they were all young academics. From different disciplines. From different disciplines mm -hmm. and different universities who were interested in the subject of freedom and the okay. free market and free enterprise. Yeah. <coughs> so it wasn't really a general audience. Yeah. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, neither was it a highly special audience. It wasn't audience. a technical economic audience. That's right. right. It yeah. was not. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I gave those lectures for two years, I think it was. And be, as a result of the two years' work, we had a set of transcripts uh, of the lecture. Mm -hmm. That was the basis of it. So far as the content of it, well, I guess the most notable thing in there was probably the proposal of the voucher That's for education. Yeah. Uh, but also... I have one other one that I would also suggest. Negative income tax was another item mm -hmm. which has received a lot of attention. Uh, uh, and which has a lot wrong with it, as well as right with it. Part of it is right and part of it is wrong, I'm afraid. And I discovered that very much uh, in, in 19, uh, oh, what was it, about oh, 68, 70, in the uh, first Nixon administration. Uh, when Nixon, uh, with the aid of uh, the senator, former, 
senator in New York. Oh, uh, Monaghan. 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 Uh, Monaghan at the time was serving as a uh, assistant, special assistant to President Nixon. I remember that. Yeah. And he took charge of trying to uh, put through a piece of legislation, the Family Welfare Plan, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, uh, I was all excited about it, interested in it. It was a direct application of the negative income tax mm -hmm. idea. But w and so I testified at, in the first draft, the first phase of it. I testified before Congress in its favor. But then Congress got to work on it. Mm -hmm. And once they got to work, I viewed the negative income tax as an alternative to all the special particular welfare programs. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying we're going to help those poor people who are housing, we're going to help those poor people who, in one way, those poor people who need food in another way, and so on. Lap them all together and say, if anybody has an income below a certain level, he'll get some help. Uh, instead of doing that, Congress started to pile this on top of all these. Yeah. And I eventually testified against it. And also, I may say I was at the time writing columns for Newsweek. And where I had written an original column praising, I wrote a later <laughs> column retracting that and saying it was a bad measure and should be rejected. Fortunately, it was not adopted. But you know, the idea of it has now been incorporated in the, uh, in the income tax credit for earned in, in the earned income, earned income tax, tax credit. credit. Yeah. That fundamentally the incorporates idea. the idea yeah. of the negative income tax. Around 1950, you had worked on flexible exchange rates, and uh, I know had a long essay then. I heard you speak on it when I was an undergraduate at Princeton. It was one of the factors that encouraged me to come to Chicago. Uh, now that took uh, led to a lot of opposition, clearly, right uh, at that time. Oh yes. Well, it was standard. Pra uh, the the standard opinion was that you had to have fixed exchange rate. After all, you had had a major conference in 1944. Mm -hmm and 45 at Bretton Woods, which had led to the establishment of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank for Recovery and Resettlement, Redevelopment, I've forgotten the exact words on it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it, was, it was sort of the inbred view that you had to have fixed exchange rates. Uh, in st indeed, uh, in a, a debate I had with uh, one of the proponents of a fixed exchange rates. He said literally that flexible exchange market would not, you could not get a trade. You could not get a price. <laughs> it was absurd and crazy. But that was the opinion at the time. However, there was also a lot of uh, uh, professional economic opinion on the side in favor of flexible exchange rates. Uh, well, what really interested me is how fast a received idea one day can become an out-of-date idea the next. Uh, the real end of flexible exchange rates came after 1971. Uh, end of F fixed exchange fixed rates, yeah. Came after 1971 when Richard Nixon, on that famous August 15, right. 1971, uh, adopted a new economic policy involving, on the one hand, a bad thing, price and right. wage control. Yeah. On the other terrible hand... Terrible thing. Not just bad. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> awful. The worst decision he ever made, yeah. as he himself yeah. said in his autobiography later, in his memoirs. <clears throat> and on the other hand, a, a good thing, namely ending the pegging of the exchange mm -hmm. rate, uh, closing the gold window, as it was said at the time. Uh, that was a real end, although it wasn't formally acknowledged until about 1973. Uh, and I remember being at a meeting of the, I think it was the, uh, some international organization dealing with exchanges, mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a panel in which the Secretary General of the IMF was present. It was a different mm -hmm. Secretary General each time. Yeah. <laughs> the first one just before 1971. Oh, we just dismissed as idle talk this mm -hmm. business. You can't possibly have have floating exchange rate, it would be chaos and so on. The, uh, two years later, just after this change, a new Secretary General of the IMF <laughs> saying on the same kind of a panel, well, we all recognize this, <laughs> the only thing that can be spot. <laughs> so, you know, there's people who think 
that there's a rigid status quo which can't possibly be broken are wrong. It, it is rigid, it's true, but it's like a, a, a pane of glass. When it breaks, it shatters. It doesn't stay there. So ideas have important Con influences. They certainly do have important but influences. But it's not easy to predict when they're going to have that influence, is it? The other thing that, uh, going back to mm. capitalism yeah. and freedom, that's in there, and that I think of, was important, was the advocacy of a, uh, of a voluntary army, of a elimination yes, of the sure. draft. Mm -hmm. That got me out of trouble when I had a debate in Madison, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin, with Leon Kaiserling, oh, yeah. who, as you remember, was the chairman of the right. Council of Economic Advisors. One of the first, uh, I think. Well, yeah, I think he was, a, he was the second chairman yeah, of the right. council. <clears throat> And he was making mincemeat of me by reading out in the, uh, uh, from Capitalism and Freedom, I had a list of things that government ought not to be doing. And he was reading those, and, you know, how absurd this was. And so he <laughs> had the students all with him until he came to my statement that, he, that it ought to end the draft and have a volunteer army. And that, the students <laughs> loved that. He lost the debate. <laughs> But uh, the well, whole take the voluntary the, army. Now, you know, in, if you look in the 50s and the 60s, that looked like it was not going to happen. We had the draft, sure, we had, right. and the draft looked solid, and people, uh, there was little support. The military was dead set against it. I know when I was at Rand, I tried to write something on the case for ending the draft, and Rand, which was then funded by the Air Force, wouldn't publish it. Huh. The Air Force just objected to it because they were getting good people who were trying to avoid the draft by enlisting in the Air Force sure. at the time. So they were completely opposed. Then we get the Vietnam War, and of course all the protests and so on, and then the Gates Commission that you were influential. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can uh, tell a little about that, because I think that was a turning point in the, uh, in the uh, elimination of the draft. Well, let me say something first. Uh, I don't want to tell you, I, I wouldn't take the position that a draft is never justified. No. It all depends on circumstances. The case that has always bothered and come to my mind was that of Israel. You have a small country mm -hmm. with a small population. Essentially, you need almost 100% of your manpower mm -hmm. for the proper army. Uh, you can justify a draft. Yeah, I think a voluntary army doesn't work well if you take, or might not work well, you're taking a significant fraction of the population. Right. You know, the price is going to, it's going to be uh, very, the taxes are going to be enormous that you're going to have right. to finance that. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. But yeah. in the United States at that time, mm -hmm. at the most, one third of the young men were being required. Mm -hmm. So you had plenty of room, lots enough mm -hmm. volunteers, reasonable prices. And, uh, the, uh, and several things contributed to the uh, success of the volunteer army, as you're saying, uh, as you were saying, the Vietnam War was critical. The protests by the students and so on, and the scandal of the draft, uh, in which uh, uh, it, the class argument could be made that the wealthy children were first going on to graduate school and the second they were going to Canada. Indeed, I believe that the uh, draft has had a great responsibility for the emergence of political correctness in our, in our colleges and universities because uh, the, uh, many of the youngsters who went on to graduate school as a way of avoiding the draft <laughs> were people who would otherwise have gone into business, they mm -hmm. would have been good entrepreneurs, right. <laughs> they would have done well, but they, they became scholars inadvertently. Yeah. <laughs> and they had very left-wing opinions and they really had no real scholarly interest in, in just being an academic. Right. Well, there they, is a have come to, they have come to populate our... our Absolutely, our, no question, it's a big problem. But now. going back to the circumstances at the time, uh, there, was a, there was a growing sentiment that something had to be done about this. And uh, the key element, the key match, the person you have to give a lot of credit to is Martin Anderson. Martin Anderson was working on uh, Richard Nixon's... Uh, research group for the campaign of 1968. And he, well, earlier than that, that's how he got to work on it, I guess. Earlier than that, he had written a memorandum, which he had shown to some of the people around Nixon in favor of a volunteer army, pointing out the argument. And uh, 
as a result of that, he became part of the Nixon research group. And uh, Nixon read the thing and looked at it. And Martin didn't know whether he agreed with it or not. And then in a, when Nixon was giving an interview to a, a newspaper man on a train ride from one place to another, the newspaper man brought up the issue of the draft. What are you going to do about that, Mr. President? Well, I'm going to, and he said, I'm going to come out in favor of a volunteer officer. <laughs> and so he committed himself on that day. And then when he became president, uh, and, and Marty became a, a special assistant, mm -hmm. uh, in the same way as Moynihan is, uh, was, uh, Marty kept pressing on it. And it was he who really was responsible for organizing the Gates Commission. That was one of the most interesting uh, experiences I've had in my life with that group. There were a group of, what was it, uh, 15, 16, something like that, on that commission, of whom uh, uh, a third of them to begin with were strongly pro-volunteer army. A third were strongly pro-draft. And a third was sort of more or less in between and committed. And it ended up with a unanimous report in favor of a volunteer army. And the process of, of discussion and uh, m meetings and listening to evidence and so on. We went through for, I don't know, a year or so of frequent meetings, weekend meetings, and had a very good research staff. Uh, it was a fascinating experience of how people get their minds changed. One idea in capitalism and freedom that I didn't realize was there, frankly, until I went back and reread Capitalism and Freedom before the, uh, the May White House meeting was for private privatization of Social Security, private retirement systems. And all the whole thing is laid out uh, pretty fully at that time. So I had thought of Chile, and I wondered sometimes where, where did Chile get it from? It? How, did, how did they come to it? But when did you come to that? Because I think that was a very influential uh, discussion. Gee, I really don't know the answer to that at all, because it was only many years later that I got involved again in discussions about it. But, you see, I think that shows a virtue uh, of, of, of pure theory, of not being unwilling to consider what seems utterly unrealistic, uh, of trying to get a nice, clean, abstract model mm -hmm. and ask yourself, what are you really trying to do? And how are you doing it? And uh, once you start thinking of the problem of Social Security that way, I think you have to come out mm -hmm. on uh, private accounts. But uh, I have no clear recollection of Where? how that came, uh, why, the, wh how I got involved in that, I just don't know. But it, uh, and, and I don't know the link exactly between the Chile experiment or uh, in that and capitalism and freedom, but I do know that one of the unsung heroes of the, uh, uh, of the Chilean experience had been a student at Chicago by the name of uh, Cast, yes. and um, he was involved in, in Mikhail, in Mikhail Cast, yes. right, very good, so he went back to be a member yes. of the uh, cabinet there. And so, I, you know, I, I don't know because he died very young whether he maybe uh, and I've heard that in Chile, that he helped bring that idea, which I would think he got maybe at Chicago. I'm trying to think of the connection uh, back to Chile, and then it, uh, they, they had the uh, situation. Again, someone like the draft, when things were very, their public system was terrible. Sure. They couldn't finance it, and pe they looked around for an alternative, and, uh, and they came up with this. Well, both of these examples illustrate a general principle. The only time you can get major change is when there's a crisis. And the function of economists, like you and me, is not really to produce change. It's to make available solutions when a crisis arises. A crisis arises, and you're going to take up some solution which is already there. Mm -hmm. At that time, you're not going to try to get to the bottom of it and start. That's true of, uh, it was true of the draft. Mm -hmm. It's true of the uh, Social Security. Uh, it's true of flexible exchange rates. In all of those cases. It's true of vouchers. I mean, it's true of vouchers. the discussion of vouchers. Right, right. And so I've always tried to say to my friends and students, don't get too exercised if what you're arguing for doesn't come about right now. It's going to go into a stockpile of ideas 
which, for which the time will come mm. when they're suitable. But a lot of people are, get frightened when they carry the logic of an analysis to a point that's very unpopular. And so they don't carry it. They don't, they don't do yeah, it. Right? And they, they shy away from doing that because then you sort of have a lot of people saying it's a crazy idea. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, who can think of such an impractical sort of, uh, sort of thing uh, like uh, maybe vouchers, the opposition vouchers met it initially. Um, almost all these ideas at times, there are a, a large fraction of the profession thought that this was really uh, oh, crazy, sure. even though it was the implications of, of clear-headed economic reasoning. Now, how do you, I mean, uh, you don't is do that anything a characteristic of Except the, encourage people yeah. to carry their ideas yeah. to its logical extreme. And doesn't that mean, coming back to a point you made earlier, it's very hard to do it if you're at an institution or a place where you're the only one with these ideas and you're almost getting no, in, no support. Uh, almost impossible. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a group of people. You've got to have some collegiality in order to be able to do it. Also, it's very hard to do it from inside Washington because inside Washington there are always these pressures on you. And you've got, it's always immediate. It's always a crisis for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's got to be done. You can't really think long term. That's why I always used to encourage my students, if you're interested in policy, you want to go to Washington, go to Washington. But don't stay more than two years or you'll be ruined. <laughs> now, there obviously have been some people who haven't been ruined, but I but think a lot of people have it's hard to come back after a longer, longer than that and, and get back and, and do research. I mean, there are very few examples, I think, I think of I think people who came right. back and, and, and did research. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to... So I'm not, I've never been sure exactly what the reason is, you know, whether it's just your interests change or you just, you're out of, you know, you've depreciated some capital, you can't get back to it, or, or maybe yeah. something else. I'm not sure, but it's a fact, I think, that it, very few people come back to In do research. In many cases, you get uh, sort of to, li to love Washington. You get to love the policy. Right. And so the temptation when you come back is not to do scientific research, but to do the kind of thing that can keep you involved in Get Washington. Get you back in there. <laughs> so you want to be a consultant yeah. to the Treasury, yeah. you want to be a consultant yeah. to the Federal Reserve Board, and uh, you intend to do that kind of work. Now, let, let me come back a, a little bit to um, some of the uh, other periods at, at Chicago that we um, were talking about. I mean, this, this predates Chicago and, and, and sort of continues with Chicago. And, and I don't have a good understanding of, of your evolution on this, so th I'd like to hear this. Now, you became very anti-Keynesian. And maybe you always were. I don't know. That's a, No, uh, I don't think I became yeah. very anti-Keynesian. Uh -huh. I became very anti-Keynesian policies eventually. But I never became anti-Keynesian if you think of Keynes as the economist. I think Keynes was a great economist. No, I did, yeah, okay. And I think yeah. the general theory is a great book. Mm -hmm. It just is that I think it offered a hypothesis which, when subjected to the evidence, turned out to be wrong. Okay. It was an insightful yeah. hypothesis. It was a very ingenious hypothesis. The only f difficulty with it was that it didn't work. <laughs> Milton, about almost 50 years ago, when I was a graduate student my first year, you gave a talk at Hitchcock Lounge, graduate dorm, that David Fand had uh, arranged. And what you spoke about at the time was on the relationship between economic freedom and political freedom. And you made the point that it's hard to have political freedom without economic freedom, but that you can have economic freedom without political freedom. And that eventually became the lead essay in your volume, Capitalism and Freedom. And I found it extremely exciting. And I remember asking you a question at the time. <laughs> you don't remember it, but I, I remember it. I, I said, well, is the evidence really strong that you could have economic freedom without political freedom? Or is that simply a temporary phenomenon? We were discussing then, I think you mentioned the Nazi period and so on, and whether these would last or would, would only be transitory. So what, what, what's your view on that at this point? Because I still am puzzled by that issue. Well, you know, it's a, that's, I think that's the most complicated issue uh, that bothers me most from what I wrote at the, in that time. 
because I now would never state it in that way. I would say now that there are three things, and you have to distinguish those three. One is economic freedom, which we discussed then. Another is civil freedom, civic freedom, the freedom of speech, the freedom to assemble, freedom to uh, publish what you want, print what you want. And the third is political freedom, meaning the freedom of the, a situation in which the members of a community are able to vote for their leaders and have the vote count. Now, the clearest, I think the confusion arises because I do not believe you can have economic freedom without a large measure of civic freedom. But I think you can have it without any political freedom at all. And that's been amply demonstrated by the case of Hong Kong. Until the Chinese took over, Hong Kong had no political freedom at all. It was run by an emissary of the British, uh, British government in London. Now, they, as it happened, the emissaries they sent out believed in economic freedom as a way to make Hong Kong most productive. And they maintained complete economic freedom. In fact, it's hard to think of any country in the world that had as much economic freedom as political as Hong Kong did at that time. For example, it had no tariff protection whatsoever, right. no restrictions on exports or imports. Uh, but it also maintained civic freedom. Absolutely. The citizens of Hong Kong felt perfectly free to say what they wanted, to print what they wanted, uh, to assemble, to meet. So clearly, empirically, it is possible to have economic freedom without political freedom. Now, Singapore is another example. You had Lee Kuan Yew, who was ostensibly an elected president, but it was fundamentally a dictator, yeah. uh, but a benevolent dictator. Right. And he, too, saw the merits in economic freedom. And while Singapore did not maintain as ex was not as pure in economic freedom as Hong Kong was, it still had a very large measure of economic freedom. So the, I, I, the answer I would give today is that I think you can have economic freedom without political freedom, provided you have a large measure of civic freedom. Yeah, L let me follow up on that a little bit because I w like to distinguish the short run and the longer run. And my, my examples that go the other way are uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Chile. Now these are three examples of, of countries that had substantial economic freedom, maybe not like Hong Kong, but you know, substantial economic freedom by world standards certainly, and started out all three of them as dictatorships in mm -hmm. one form or another. You, you, you had Pinochet in, in Chile who promoted economic freedom, maybe as a last resort, but he promoted it and it was successful. You had the Kuomintang in, when they went to Taiwan, eventually started promoting economic freedom, and you had similarly in uh, South Korea. But they evolved uh, in all three cases without any revolution or so on. They evolved into not only more civic freedom, but also a really substantial political freedom. Now, in all three of these nations, you're having, you know, by most of the uh, criteria, they would, you would say they'd have political freedom. The question I have, and unfortunately Hong Kong can't answer it anymore because it's now part of China, was if Hong Kong had persisted with a substantial amount of economic freedom, considerable civil freedom, uh, would it have been able to have maintained? Would there have been growing protests opposition movements, they wanted to have the right to elect their own government and so on. And would that have created what happened in, in these other cases? And that's, that's the question. I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, well, I'm not, answer. obviously, I'm not sure of the answer either. Because there sort of is a two-way relationship between political freedom and economic freedom. In a way, a growth in economic freedom tends to promote political freedom for the reasons you're citing. Uh, as in China now, where there's a, a real protests in the villages about having to, uh, having to have the bureaucrats named by Beijing run them. And there are, are beginning to be le uh, elections for local leaders in the first steps. So in that sense, economic freedom promotes political freedom. On the other hand, political fr uh, uh, gro uh, you have the situation that political freedom Promotes a lack of economic freedom, opposes economic freedom. 
promotes a growth in government. You take a case like the United States. We have had complete political freedom, but uh, the extent of economic freedom has been declining, not increasing. And it's been declining precisely because we have political freedom. So I don't think you can give a simple answer because it's a two-way relationship. No, and I also think it's, there's a fair bit of evidence now that as countries evolve economically, you have a tendency to go toward political freedom. Now, I think you're raising an interesting complication. Once you get the political freedom, there may be forces that are set up that begin to throttle some of the economic freedom. The governments get bigger. And that's why I wanted to move to a, a, a subject where that's the center of the subject. As you know, there's been some opinion in recent years uh, called the end of history, that somehow the oh, whole sure. world had moved and now we've uh, moved toward free markets and political democracy, and that's been the, the goal of all this historical forces, and the future looks very rosy. Uh, I can guess your views on that, but I think it would be nice to he hear how confident are you about that, and what do you see as the problems in the future? Now, I don't believe that that's valid at all. The, uh, first of all, the people who put out that view have a very generous interpretation of a free economy. For their, from their point of view, as long as you have markets of some kind, it's a free economy. It doesn't really matter how, whether those markets are manipulated. It doesn't much matter if the government has extensive controls over those. It's still a free democracy. In the second reason, place, my view of history is very different. My view of history is that it runs in long, long swings. And that uh, the, the question of a free economy is, enters into that. You start with Adam Smith in 1776. It was at a time when you had a highly controlled economy, Mercant left in that case, in which the belief was that the strength of a nation depended on how much gold it could have, and the way to get gold was to keep out the products of other people, but to sell as many, many of your products as you could. Uh, something which was possible for a few countries, but which was self-defeating on the world scale. Adam Smith started an intellectual revolution uh, toward, a, uh, toward a world of freedom. Uh, he would have been in favor, of course, of economic freedom, political freedom, <laughs> civic freedom, all sorts. But it took about, what, 40, 60 years? Nine, 18, when were the Corn Laws? 1840s. 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 Right. So it took about 60 yeah. years. It took a long time. And then, from then, in the 19th century, that kept going. And Britain really moved toward more economic freedom and more political freedom. But then about the 1880s or so, you had the Fabian Society formed. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what date it is, but it's sometime. Around that time. Sometimes around that time. And intellectual opinion started to shift away from, from the Cobden Bright belief mm -hmm. in, in free markets, no tariffs. Uh, and, and as I say, the repeal of the Corn Laws. And you started to have a movement that's already obvious in the early 20th century uh, in, uh, uh, toward greater government involvement. Uh, that's about the time when the government took over the schools. Uh, and it's also the time when you had the movement toward imperial uh, preference, toward uh, social insurance, uh, early right. stages of the mm -hmm. Social Security system. Uh, it's one of the most interesting books I know. is a book on uh, 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 Law and Public Opinion by Dicey, oh, yeah. A.V. Dicey. Right. I know. And in, yeah. the, in, the, in, the 19, for, in the preface he wrote to the 1914 reprint of his book, uh, he, he essentially predicts the welfare state that came in the 30s and 40s uh, as a result of that. Well, that set in motion, uh, that mo movement set in motion another trend. That trend, which was uh, the main names you can associate with that one, are Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig mm -hmm. Mises, Lionel Robbins. Uh, Milton so, Friedman. <laughs> well, a little later, a little later, <laughs> right. And that was a movement toward uh, pointing out the difficulties were, which were arising. It was 
I think, best encapsulated by the title of Hayek's great pamphlet, The Road to Serfdom. Right. And you, you started to have a movement in public, an opinion, back the other way. But that movement in opinion, again, which I would say started you know, at the something like 19, late 30s, early 40s, something probably that late, mm -hmm. uh, that movement in opinion had no effect at all for 20 or 30 or 40 right. years. But then as government grew, and as the public at large became dissatisfied with what was happening with government growing, uh, you got more and more backing, more and more, it affected the opinion more generally. And finally, around 1980, it started to have a real effect. With the fall of the Berlin Wall mm -hmm. and the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became, you got the doctrine you were talking about. But again, uh, that's a wave. It hasn't worked itself out yet by any manner of means. But when it does, I have no doubt that there will be a wave in the opposite direction that will come along, and you'll move back again. Well, there's a tendency often to confuse waves with trends. I mean, people were sending, saying there was the end of the business cycle because we had a number of years of good runs, and then we went into a cycle, and similarly. But to come back to the collapse of, of, of communism, it was one of the great events of the, uh, certainly the last 50 years, maybe the whole century. Uh, to what extent would you say that the ideas that you mention of Hayek, von Mises, Friedman, and others were crucial? Well, my, I, I think that what was important in the collapse of the Soviet Union was the internal forces within the Soviet Union, uh, exacerbated at the end by the arms race into which Reagan forced them. And that stretched them a little too far. And they, they broke. But sooner or later they would have broken because the internal structure was so inefficient and incompatible with human beings and human values. On the other hand, and so I don't believe that the writings of Mises, Hayek, so on, had very much to do with it. On the other hand, I think those writings had an enormous amount to do with the interpretation that was placed on the collapse and the conclusions that were drawn from it. If it hadn't been for those writings, the conclusion wouldn't have been, oh, well, the alternative is a free market. That wouldn't have been the conclusion. No, right. The conclusion would have been fascism or some other yeah. kind mm -hmm. of a detail. So I think that uh, it's always important to distinguish between events and the interpretation mm -hmm. people place on events. You come back to the Great Depression uh, from this point of view, which is a lovely illustration. Mm -hmm. There was an event, a clear event, no arguments about mm -hmm. the facts. Interpretation placed on it, a, a failure of private business, yeah. evidence that you needed the government to come in and stabilize things. We had that discussion yesterday. At right, the that discussion yeah. we had at the conference mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, uh, by now, fortunately, has been reinterpreted. And nobody thinks that way anymore. If, if, we, if you had continued to think that way, you would have had more Great Depressions. So, so as we look forward now, we have the set of uh, important ideas on free markets, as you said, maybe starting with Adam Smith and evolving over time into the modern period. We have events that might come up in the future. We have also a, a, a good deal of intellectuals, many intellectuals, who are closet socialists, in my judgment, who are, who are waiting for some uh, difficulties, and then they'll come, become more explicit. And every time there's a little bit of difficulties, they begin to emerge in a way. You can't have global market, financial markets. They're too unstable. So uh, do you see, the, as you look forward to the, uh, to the next decade or two, uh, the likelihood that there'll be some events, maybe we can't predict what they will be now, that will bring this force this anti-market force that has been not completely but somewhat suppressed now more into the forefront and that people will look for solutions in, in the direction of you know, more government ownership, uh, even more than we have now, more centralized control. Maybe not the old Soviet model, I, that's probably going to be a long time before sure. people go back to that, but some new 
inefficient type of system where the government plays and, and centralized, more central direction plays a bigger role? It's possible, but I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not as pessimistic about that because the government is so damn inefficient that uh, it's increasingly recognized that that's not the way to go. And the forces of the market operate in such subtle and indirect and unperceived ways that I think they will keep winning the race for at least a few decades in advance. Now, what happens beyond that, who knows? Every, much, so much is going to depend on what happens to China, what happens to India. Those are the great countries that are today in a transition process between, uh, well, they're, they're very different, but China is on a transition process from collectivism in economics and in politics to market ruling in economics and an uneasy kind of a political uh, structure, which I think from the long run point of view has to disappear. I think that the market is not likely to be consistent. Uh, a, full, a full application of the market is not likely to be consistent with a collectivist rule of the kind that China has. So I think sooner or later in the next 10 years or so, you are going to come to another Tiananmen Square kind of an episode. And when it does, I think it will be evolved in a democratic direction. I think the young people in China are thinking very differently than their, their elders. And India is a very different case. Well, the Chinese, it's if I can interrupt a minute, Milton, then the Chinese would indicate that that sort of supports the view that when you have strong economic freedom, that puts a lot of pressure on the political sector, right. and you, you, you're very likely, or often, will see a conversion from a very so sort of totalitarian regime to one that allows more political freedom, certainly civil freedom. As in the cases you cited in Korea yeah, right. and okay. in Taiwan. Yeah. Are you going to talk about India? As well, India way? is quite different because it's been able to maintain a democracy. And there you have had the case where you've had political freedom, a considerable yeah. measure of political mm -hmm. freedom, with very little economic freedom. It's, a, it's an outlier, as it were, in that sense. But it's beginning to wake up. It's beginning to have uh, to Changing. give more role to economic yeah, no freedom. Question. And if it can retain its political freedom in the process, it will help prevent the kind of reverse that you're fearing. Well, if you look at the United States, let's look at the United States. I mean, government is relatively small in the United States compared to Europe but not small by any standards no, that you and right. I would like. What, 35% to 40% would, uh, 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 would go through, counting federal, state, and local? Well, I think what you give. the figures I think uh, I, I, I get are that if you add federal, state, and local, government spending is just roughly 40% right, okay. That's of right. national yeah. income, right. not gross national no, product, yeah, but income. national income. Yeah. And the point you made earlier, the... Uh, regulations, the indirect influence of government in that way. Uh, 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 the estimate is that it accounts for about another 10% of national income. So mm -hmm. roughly we're 50% we're socialist. Right. But <laughs> however, the socialist part is so inefficient that we're 50% socialist, but probably the non-socialist half produces 80% of the income. No question. No qu I remember for a while in China, when they went to this individual responsibility system on farms, people had these small plots, they were producing right. most of the output. Some of it may have been just the way they, they were reallocating their time and so on, but certainly efficiency was great. But look at the, again, look at the United States. Uh, we've been talking about some of the sort of perverse trends in the United States. Uh, and one of them that's very recent is the issue of corporate governance. We had clearly a few scandals where there was some um, malfeasance on the part of um, uh, executives and uh, maybe some accounting companies. And as a result of that, we got a lot of panic. We got some, what strikes me, as very unattractive legislation in, in terms of uh, in, rules and, and restrictions imposed on in corporate government. So uh, be, uh, I'd like to hear you know, your reaction to that. Well, I think the interpretation, the general interpretation that was placed on it was that, you know, these people who run businesses are all a bunch of crooks. And you can't trust them. They're going to go, they're going into the bottom, uh, stealing from their customers. And it's a wholly wrong perception 
of the market. Uh, the market imposes standards. The, you don't make money over a long run by being dishonest. You make money over a long run by establishing a reputation for being reliable, for being uh, square and honest. And moreover, if you look at these particular cases, you want to ask yourself a question. How did they come up? How, 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 come, how were they discovered? Was it a, a snooping government official mm -hmm. who discovered that Enron was doing mm -hmm. wrong things? Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. It was the market that yeah. discovered it. The market, the price of the Enron stock started to go down. Yeah. And who punished the Enron right. people? The market punished mm -hmm. Enron people. They drove their price to nothing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's a tragedy that innocent people were hurt mm -hmm. in the process. Uh, the same thing is true of all of the others. Every single one of these ca candles uh, was, a, uh, was discovered by the market. Now, this is not something new. You've got a very active, vigorous, dynamic, competitive in industrial area. And there are going to be some bad apples in that mm -hmm. process, especially when something that looks so good starts going bad and people are desperate to find a way out of it. Some of them are going to resort to illegal, mm -hmm. fraudulent activities. And that's kind of the price you pay. Uh, Schumpeter's creative, creative mm -hmm. destruction. The price you pay for having an effective system. If you, uh, and indeed, if you start to try too hard to, to cut it down, you're going to have perverse effects. In fact, I think some of these difficulties arise from the laws that were passed about two decades ago in response to the, uh, all the uh, scandals about uh, takeovers, internal takeovers. Mm -hmm. That produced a, space of new, a spate of new laws on insider trading, making crimes out of things that should never be crimes. Absolutely. So I think the situation is quite the reverse of that which is, uh, which is perceived. It, it, the lesson to draw is not that you have a private market which can't be depended on, which is dishonest and so on, and you have to have the, the strong hand of the government come in and uh, take care. On the contrary, what you have to do is to try to devise institutions which will enable the, the, you, to have competition in competitive markets. If people are doing things like that, it's an opportunity for somebody else to make money out of them. Uh, one other thing. If you think, uh, people talk about the law, uh, uh, about a profit economy. I think that's a misnomer. It's a, it's a profit and loss economy. Right. And the loss part is, if anything, more important than the profit part. Because it's the loss part that keeps capital from being wasted. If you consider the telecommunication industry right now, uh, it was over, there was a, something of a bubble in it. There was overcapitalization, too much uh, money spent in expanding capacity. Somehow it has to be, that has to be corrected. And some of these scandals are really part of the correction process, which are keeping good, more good money from being tossed after bad. Suppose you contrast the situation when you have a scandal in government. How is it discovered? You know, there are many scandals in government mm -hmm. that are at least the same size, sure. but they tend to be hushed up and concealed. Very seldom do you have a teapot dome mm -hmm. affair that comes out and gets public publicity. Moreover, on the case of the profit and loss element, a government project, a government uh, uh, project may be just as intelligent when it started as a uh, private project. The real problem is that it has no exit strategy. If a private project like Enron makes a mistake and fails, it has no alternative. It either gets a subsidy from the government or it goes out of business, and that's true. If a public enterprise fails, like, for example, subsidizing agriculture, like mm -hmm. trying to maintain right. agriculture, what happens? It gets expanded. It gets more money. Surely, what we have, the, uh, the amount of money that has gone down the drain in, in, in maintaining an excessive agricultural industry dwarfs by many times the amount of money lost in all of these uh, private scandals. So I think government ought to pay more attention to its own affairs and give a freer hand to private business.
Well, this leads to one important issue where, where you've been very important among the many areas where you've been important is on economic education because if, if, if the population had, had better appreciation of how markets operate in this particular context, and if, including journalists and readers of, of journalism and so on, uh, then maybe you, you get more pressure against stepping in to uh, for the, the politicians stepping in. Politicians are responding to what they perceive of as a demand. I mean, sure. they know, they've found their own interests. So they're perceiving this as a demand. The media certainly gave relenting, uh, unrelenting attention to, the, to these issues. And, and many voters came away with the view, our oh, business people, uh, men and women, <laughs> are a bunch of crooks. Now, how does one improve? Uh, you, I mean, you, you had a, a, a remarkably successful uh, television series, Free to Choose, enormous influence, book based on it by you and Rose, enormously influential. You wrote Newsweek columns for, what, 20 years or so that were uh, great Eight. columns. 18 years. 18 years. Uh, well, not too, not too bad. Pretty close. <laughs> not too bad. Pretty now, close. They were enormously influential, and I think it's helped. I, I think the literacy of people uh, have improved, I think, significantly. But I think still it's a long way to go to get rid of this uh, in hostility bred partly by the academy now, which have uh, teaching in subjects, not less so in economics and history and many other subjects, an intrinsic hostility to markets and market forces. How can we... Are there any uh, ways that we can think of that can further improve, never make it perfect, but further improve the literacy of the, uh, you know, the educated and even uneducated? Uh, well, the problem uh, of the literacy of the educated is, I think, a much more difficult task. But the, uh, the education, is, I think, from a different point of view, is a scandal. We have roughly a quarter of the uh, youngsters in this country never graduate from college, uh, from high school. High school yeah. From high school, uh, we have a level of literacy today in the United States, which is lower than it was a hundred years ago. We have an elementary and secondary school system, which is a relic of the 17th century. We teach our kids today the same way as we did then, and the reason is a very simple one. It's, it's a, the reason is it's a monopoly. You have 90% of all kids go to government schools. Government schools, in turn, have been taken over by trade unions, the National Education Association, and the American Federation of Teachers. They have enormous political power. They have annual incomes over a billion dollars. And three quarters of that is devoted not to uh, union activities, but to public policy and providing political scores. And uh, the w one result of that is that their emphasis is on the teachers, and the quality of teachers has been going down. The uh, uh, educate our so-called educational schools, if you take university after university, the lowest SAT scores of entering students are the students who go into education. Yes, and that's a terrible way of laying a basis <coughs> for the kind of training you want. And, there, and in my opinion, there is one way, a way, only one way in which you're going to solve that. You're never going to reform it from inside. You can't reform any institution from inside because you get, you, people don't act against their own interests. Mm -hmm. you, the only way you reform institutions is by competition from the outside. And that's what we need. And what inhibits this competition from the outside is that we have adopted the policy that government will not only finance schooling, but will also produce schooling, that it will run the schools. If you, if you think about the problem and consider it in a slightly different area, government finances uh, poor people with food stamps. Suppose it required mm -hmm. them to spend those food stamps mm -hmm. in government stores, yeah. government grocery stores. Would they be like our present supermarkets? Mm -hmm. Very unlikely. And that's what we're doing in schooling. And so Some countries me, require that for health. They have to take their medicine in government-run <laughs> hospitals and so on. Right. Well, to some extent, they do now in medicine. Yeah, right. You're getting the same problem. Yeah. At any rate, uh, it seems to me the way to, solve, the, the, the way to move toward solving it, I won't say to solve it, but the way to make a dent in it, 
is by introducing more competition through giving parents more of an opportunity to choose. Many parents now have an opportunity to choose. Those in the upper and middle classes can choose a place to live which has good schools. Many of them can afford to pay twice for schooling, so they send their child to a private school but continue to pay taxes, of course, to support public schools. But there's a large fraction of the population, probably two-thirds or something like that, that is not in a position to make a real choice, who have to go to the school that they're assigned to. And I have long been in favor of a voucher system for those people. Government is now spending in the state of California something like $9,000 per child in school. Well, if, if, you, if a California citizen takes his child out of the public school and puts it into a private school, he's saving the state $99,000. Why shouldn't the state say to him, look, we'll split that distance. We'll give you a voucher for $4,500 and you go and spend it however you want, provided it's on education. And that way we'll benefit, you'll benefit, and you'll have more freedom of choice. I think it's strictly unethical now, what we're doing now, to force people to pay for the schooling of their children without giving them any control over how that schooling is done. That's, uh, that's the pr proposal, that's the voucher scheme that uh, Rose and I some years ago set up a foundation for the sole and solitary purpose of trying to educate the public at large on the importance of parental choice and on the a voucher system as a means to attain parental choice. Uh, I believe the intellectual battles have been won by the proponents of choice and vouchers. I mean, they're still going on, but I think the, the opposition uh, has lost its enthusiasm and has lost its support. And, and uh, the political battles, though, is where the opposition still remains. And so let me... Uh, continue on that because I think the, you know, these are important areas that uh, I know you're very interested, you and Rose, and they're very important for the country because at the same time that human capital and education is becoming more important for the advancement of, a, of the U.S. economy and the world economy uh, because it's more knowledge based and so on, we're not preparing very well a significant fraction of our population. Now, the, the proponents of choice differ in a, in a number of, di of dimensions. For example, uh, where the charter school movement is to be encouraged or whether that's a way, because uh, those are still public schools, right, chartered by the public body uh, with some independence of, of the traditional system. Do you, do you see that as a good development or a way of of defeating ultimately the goal of having open competition between public and, and private schools. It's a halfway house, and it's good in the extent to which it gives some people a great degree of choice, but it is not a long-run solution, and I don't think it will have it will, if anything, I think promote uh, the voucher schools. But I think there's a different division, which in some ways is more important and more basic. There are two approaches toward vouchers in two constituencies. One has to do with vouchers for low-income people, mm -hmm. where it's a welfare program. Now, that's a worthy effort and something that's well worth doing. Mm -hmm. But there's another view of it, which in my view is more important. And that's that, the ver that what you want to do is to have a competitive educational industry in which you will let loose the forces of competition which have done so much to change every other area in which it's yes. entered. And you can only do that if you have a broad market. And you can only do that if you have a market in which uh, you have a whole range of prices. You have some expensive schools, some inexpensive schools. And from that point of view, we have always been in favor of universal vouchers. The vouchers that are not limited by uh, income or by anything else, of vouchers in which the voucher schools are free to charge more than the voucher amount. You know, it's an interesting thing and a very important thing. So you can top up the voucher with additional expenditure if the parents want to. That's right. an important point because some of the current voucher systems do not allow that. That's right, and I think that's a mistake. But you know, there's a general point of which this is an illustration. If you look at the course of history, all progress 
has ultimately benefited the lower income the most. And the procedure, the process is very simple. Uh, what you have is that a new product is introduced, television is introduced. The early television sets are extremely expensive. Only the rich can afford to buy them. But in the process of buying them, they provide the capital for expansion and innovation. And the course of events is that what begins as a luxury for the sure. poor ends as a necessity for the masses. Well, the rich allow them to experiment in ways learned by doing, and they get more efficient at it. Right. And similarly in schooling, mm -hmm. if you have a program which is for the poor, if you have a program which is limited by income, you're going to have a program for the poor, and it's going to be a poor program. Mm -hmm. You're not going to attract the kind of competition, the kind of free market enterprise that you want. If you have a universal voucher where parents at all levels are able to choose the schools their children go to, and they're able to top up to mm -hmm. add some money if they want to, you're going to open an enormous field. You know, this is a big industry. We spend, what is it, over $300 billion a year, I think, on the industry. So it's a big industry. It would be a brand new field for research. For research. You know, there's no other industry in the United States except politics, which is so obsolete, which is, which is still operating on the basis of principles of 300 years ago. And that's because these are the only industries in which there's no competition. Yeah.